Theater. Bienvenidos y bienvenidas. Feliz lunes. Feliz lunes. Uh, Carlos, me encanta la foto de Bryce. Es una foto de Bryce, ¿no? Ah, es Bryce, el cañón de Bryce es un lugar, es un lugar fantástico. Me encanta. Uh, muchas veces mi familia y yo vamos de vacaciones a, a Bryce y es, es un paraíso. Ok. Uh, a ver, bueno, uh, y además de, además de ser lunes, hoy es un día especial, es un día feriado, es un día feriado, voy a escribirlo en la uh, chat box, sí, uh, uh, con acentos, espero, un día feriado. Uh. Es un día feriado. It's a holiday. Hoy es un día feriado. Hoy es día de los muertos. Hoy es el día de los muertos. Es el día de los muertos. El 2 de noviembre, muchas veces hasta el 3 de noviembre. Es el día de los muertos. Y vamos a, vamos a hablar de Dios de, de los muertos. It is uh, very fortuitous that we have class. I kind of had some other plans, but I rearranged it because this is too good an opportunity to pass up. Uh, Dia de los Muertos is not celebrated in Spain at all. It is exclusively a holiday for uh, Mexico and, and even predominantly, you could say, even more so once you get to Southern Mexico, into a bit of Guatemala, a little bit into that, that little bit of Central America countries down there. Uh, Dia de, de los Muertos aquí es importante también. Here, here it's important too, because of the large number of uh, Mexican immigrants and people of Mexican nationality that we have in Arizona, it has become a pretty prevalent thing. But a lot of people don't really understand what it is. and. And even with kids who grew up Hispanic in the family, there's kind of this fight between Halloween, Dia de Muertos, Halloween, Dia de Muertos, and it's kind of a juggling act, but the further down the number of generations you get. But um, Dia de los Muertos is actually a much more, uh, it, it is a holiday of much more spiritual, much greater spiritual meaning in regards to family. So I do want to talk a little bit about that and depending on how much time we get. Um, if we don't get time to watch the video, we will at least watch parts of it so that you can see what it looks like for a genuine celebration of that. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. What I do want to make sure I fit in first is a little, uh, un, re, un repaso, un repaso de, um, the tildes, the little accent mark issue. Yeah, and like to go through that because I'm sure you have some questions on it. It's actually very simple, but for some reason people always, people always have difficulty with this, even though I can tell you it's simple and then it makes you feel bad because you say, but I thought it was hard. <laughs> I don't say that to make anybody feel badly. Uh, but, um, you know, there are very simple rules but we'll talk about that a little bit. We'll take any questions you got from that. So why, I know you sent a bunch of questions and so we'll, we'll talk about those, but I wanna cover the uh, accent mark things first because that does a little bit of our pronunciation practice as well. And then get into this direct object again, another uh, session on where they go and what were all these things about. So if you've got a copy either online or whatever of this, uh, you know, Marianne, you'd have the copy I sent you online. Or so if you had to print it out, or if you have the book, El Libro, do make sure you pull it out. What we'll be looking at reviewing to see if you got the answers correct, or if you're like, okay, I saw what the answer was, but I don't know why. Um, 
en la página. Son los ejercicios en las páginas 184, 185. Ok, vale. Um, and we'll do a lot on um, those pronouns and where they are placed. Where they are placed. Um, vale. Voy a, voy a compartir primero. I'm going to share first because this specific question came up. On the Nearpod module you had with rules of why we have accent marks or why we don't, there was a little video where he gave you some words. And some folks did have questions on that. So uh, I'm going to do a little uh, whiteboard share screen. Ooh, and I've got to move a bunch of screens around to do that. So actually, I won't see many of you while I do this. I'm trying to do a gazillion screens. That's kind of tough. Okay, but I want to see the words that were in the specific question. Ooh, donde, 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 donde? Necesito aquí. I need to get. Oh, it's going to force me to write with a pen. No, it's not. Okay. Woo. Ya no, not quite. We're almost there. Okay. A ver. Bueno. Uh, Pueden ver. Uh, Perdón, pueden ver, you cannot probably see it. Take this off for a moment. I'm trying very hard to get my technology to work. Okay. Tenemos las palabras aquí, uh, dócil, and uh, estrés. There were three words in there that had, um, the question was, why were these words the way they were? Okay, por ejemplo, aquí. ¿Por qué lleva? Uh, ¿Por qué lleva? Se, uh, llevo, it wears. <laughs> it wears an accent mark. Uh, ¿Por qué tiene um, uh, tilde? Why does it have that little accent mark? Aquí, la palabra aquí. Uh, aquí termina en I. It ends in the letter I. En español se dice I. Ok. Um, Words that end in a vowel or N or S will naturally stress the second to last syllable. The second to last syllable will, would be this, that ah sound that you see in blue, in azul. But the way we pronounce that word, aquí, the way we pronounce it, breaks the rule of punch second to the last syllable. That is why we have to write in the accent mark on the E sound at the end, because that is not normally, if you saw it written out, that is not the accent you would normally stress, but because the way we pronounce it breaks that rule, we write in the accent mark. So there are actually two things going on with this whole accent business. One is you have to actually hear how the word is pronounced. Okay, if the way the word is pronounced obeys the rules, then you don't need an accent mark. If the way the word is pronounced breaks those accent rules, then that is why we have to have a written accent mark in there. Okay, there are a couple of other reasons for having accent mark. One is on Interrogative words, who, what, when, where, why, the newspaper kind of questions. You have to have an accent mark. It's just a rule they have. The other thing is there are some super shorty words that and they're, they're almost always one syllable most of the time. And sometimes they have two different meanings. The same word 
will have two extremely different meanings. And then we write an accent mark in, not to show you where, okay, punch the syllable instead of the other, but just to distinguish one definition from another definition. Okay, but normalmente, pero normalmente, uh, cuando la manera de, de pronunciar uh, no sigue las reglas, when the way of pronouncing does not follow the rules, that's when we need to put in an accent mark. A uh, la otra palabra del video, dócil, dócil, dócil lleva acento. Dócil termina en L, it ends in L. Normally, you would expect that the punch, the, the harder stress would be on the final syllable, okay? When the last letter of a word is any consonant, except for N or S, it's every other consonant. Not N, not S, not a vowel. We punch the end of the word, but the way we pronounce that word does not follow that rule. So we have to write it in on the O. And this word, estrés. Estrés means stress. <laughs> Quiere decir stress. Okay. Estrés. Last letter. Uh, last letter is S. Okay. When a word ends in a vowel, A E I O U, or the letter N, or the letter S, ah, boom. Here we have the word estrés. We punch the second to last syllable. But we are not putting greater emphasis, putting greater force on this, the syllable S at the beginning, the starter, okay? We are punching the very end instead, okay? The way we pronounce the word breaks that rule. So I must write in the accent mark on the last E of estrés. Okay, this is done so that in the writing system, uh, in the writing system, when you see a word written out, if it breaks a rule and you see the word written out, you know exactly how to pronounce it. Uh, in many different languages like French, an accent mark, whether it goes this way or that way, it actually changes the pronunciation of that letter somewhat. In Spanish, that does not happen. The accent mark does not change the way the vowel is pronounced. And accent marks always go over a vowel, A-E-I-O-U, always over a vowel. That's the way the, this language works, okay? I would have students sometimes, they would madly trying to be writing accent marks over N, <laughs> over T, it's like, no, those don't get, I'm sure there are other languages where they do, but not here. So always over a vowel, and it does not change the way the vowel is pronounced. It, it changes the force of, you know, the, of, of how hard a punch you give to each syllable in a word, okay? When you show, um, when you show, oh, when you say the word examination in English, people don't really know if they see it written out. Is it examination? 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 You know, we don't have any real hard and set rules in English to tell people if you have a multi syllable word, where do you put? more stress. The joke is you've got to put the right, the right emphasis on the correct syllable. And you hear how bad it sounds to say the right, you know, the right stress on the right syllable, since we don't say syllable, right? That's what it is, syllable instead of syllable, okay? And Spanish is the same thing, except it actually does write in an accent mark where needed. So where we vary, where the spelling, you know, isn't following the, the way we pronounce the word, we actually write in the accent mark. Uh, and I'm glad you liked the accent mark video. Um, 
there are a lot of very good accent mark videos. Uh, some of them are a little bit different. Um, uh, the one with uh, Brenda, there was one with Brenda from Argentina and hers is uh, a little more, it shows you the nuances of how stress can change, um, can actually change what a word means. So the reason this really becomes important, uh, you know what, I'm gonna share a screen with you one more time. Um, Here's where it becomes important. Um, it's not really such a big deal. You've learned this word te, right? You know, ah, te veo, oi, I see you today, right? But this word te means tea, the, the drink made out of dried plant leaves, right? Um, uh, me means my, something that belongs to me. Mi esposo, mi casa, mis gatos, okay? But uh, when I spell it with this, it still sounds like me, right? This gives you an idea of these monosyllabic words where one gets an accent, one doesn't. This me, con, con, uh, con tilde, with an accent mark, uh, it means me, M-E in English, right? Para mí, para mí, el lunes es buen día. For me, Monday is a good day. All right? So that is not such a big deal. But you do, um, there is a very definite difference in these two words. Uh, hable, hable, no lleva. Uh, no lleva uh, tilde. It does not carry an accent mark. Hable is a command, speak. Uh, but if I change the stress and I say hable, they both come from hablar. Uh, but the meaning of hable is very different. Whereas hable is a command, I'm telling you, hey, do this action of yep, 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 right? Hable means that I did it like yesterday, two hours ago in the past. So they're shifting the emphasis from one syllable to another actually changes the tense of the word, the time frame of who is doing it and when it is happening. So accent marks can be a big deal when you're talking about verbs, I think, more importantly than even just regular accent marks. Okay, but everybody starts with the regular accent marks. You studying? Okay. Hay alguna pregunta? Is there any kind of question? I'm gonna have a different thing for us to practice this in a minute. Yes. Does that make more sense now or not? Uh, so I have one clarification. So the first video, she described words that uh, fall into four categories, the aguda, grave. Oh, so, I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't worry too much about all those categories of what they call them. Okay, because the only one she put accent mark is the one in the uh, Estru Hula and then the Sobre Estru Hula category. Yeah. So because that's why I was confused why are this word because the emphasis is not on the third from the last or further from the last. Yeah. The don't don't get too caught up on what they call all those categories. And to be honest, I have to kind of look at all the namings of those categories because to be honest, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter that much. I mean, unless you are, I don't know, like so deep in the ground. It, if you're just speaking regularly with people, just knowing that something has an accent mark and that okay. you punch one syllable more than the other is way more important than knowing the names for all those categories. Kind of doesn't matter really. Uh, not for the casual speaker. Uh, it, you know what, it, it gets, if you were in a college course, on phonetics, it would matter. For anybody speaking, just with anybody, 
even in business, it doesn't matter. Um, okay. Hay más preguntas o no? No, okay. Vale. Voy a compartirles a un, a, con ustedes una pantalla. I'm going to share a screen with you and I'm going to pronounce each word and I want you to kind of check and see if you think it should carry an accent mark or not. Okay, some of these will be words you have heard. You may or may not have seen them written, but you have heard them. Some of them are words you've never heard before at all. Uh, y eso no importa. Doesn't matter if you know what the word really means. Ooh, oops, I got the wrong screen up. Perdón. Una vez más, one more time. Donde está? Está aquí. Okay. A ver. Bueno, aquí. Pueden ver. Tenemos la palabra escribimos. Ustedes ven la palabra escribimos, ¿no? Sí. Ven la palabra. Okay. Cuando yo pronuncio. Cuando yo pronuncio la palabra, ustedes deben decirme, deben decirme, you should tell me, uh, tilde o no hay tilde. Hay tilde, hay tilde. Is there an accent? No hay tilde. Ok, vale. Ok. La primera palabra. Escribimos. No hay tilde. This follows the rule. The last letter is S. The whatever, what, whether the word is a noun or a preposition or a verb doesn't matter. Only thing that matters is the last letter of that word. Uh, words that end in uh, vowels or N or S should stress the second to the last syllable. So I'm putting the second to the last syllable in bold. Actually, I should put the whole thing in. That's the whole bold syllable. Escribimos, escribimos, escribimos. The way I pronounce it obeys that rule. Don't need an accent mark. Okay, la segunda palabra es útil, útil. Lleva asiento o no? Útil. 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 Sí, lleva asiento. It does. Carry an accent mark. ¿Y por qué? Why? It ends in a consonant that is not S, is not N. It ends in a consonant. Vowels are A, E, I, O, U. Everything else in it is a consonant, okay? Uh, words that end in a consonant that is not N or S, they usually stress the last syllable. But I don't pronounce this util. If I pronounced it util, it would be okay with no accent mark. But we pronounce the word util, util. So it has to be written in, okay? Bien. Now, if you miss that, do you see why? The last letter is an L, and that is not N, it is not S, it's a consonant. So I'm not punching the N, I'm punching something else. I have to put my accent mark where I do hear that emphasis, that, that force. Okay, uh, here's the word for efficient, eficaz. Eficaz. Lleva tilde o no? Eficaz. No lleva tilde. Has no accent mark. Eficaz termina en Z. It ends in a Z. Termina en Z. If the last letter of any word is a consonant, not N, not S, we punch the last syllable. Eficaz. Eficaz is where we have, oop, perdón. Uh, oop, and it's actually the whole last syllable is cas, eficaz, and it obeys, it obeys that rule. Okay. 
Ah, aquí termina en A. Ah, termina en A. Ah. This one's a little tricky because it's not just A, it's IA. IA together forms what they call a diphthong. Who cares? Okay. What a diphthong means is it's two vowels together. Okay. Normally, usually in Spanish, when two little vowels go walking together, uh, right next to each other, they kind of blend together. And they only get an accent mark if I punch one or the other. So if I were to punch the E more than the A uh, or the A uh, more than the E, mm, then maybe I need an accent mark. Okay, here's the word for bakery. Panaderia, panaderia. Lleva tilde o no lleva tilde? Lleva tilde o no lleva tilde? Panaderia. Lleva tilde. It does get an accent mark. Ooh, esto es difícil. This is a tough one. Um, hmm. Normally, we would blend these two sounds together. And the stress would be back up here. So I'm going to bold. If the way I pronounce this word was panaderia, panaderia, it would not need an accent mark if I said this word panaderia, but people would look at me funny if I said panaderia because that's not what we stress, <laughs> okay? It's panaderia. And because I am literally separating out this E and A, ah, I, I am punching this diphthong, I'm punching this one uh, E sound more than the A uh, sound. And it's right at the end, I need an accent mark. This IA, uh, they're not split off into like two separate syllables, right? I do not punch the DE, panaderia, it's panaderia, panaderia, lleva acento. Many, many words that end in E, I have an accent mark, but not all words that end in E, I have an accent mark. Okay, vamos a ver. La palabra para pharmacy, par, uh, farmacia, farmacia, farmacia. Lleva tilde o no? Farmacia. No lleva tilde, it does not need an accent mark. We punch this more, that is correct. It ends in an ah, and the second from last syllable goes back here to this ma syllable, okay? Here's the second to the last, farmacia. The way I say it obeys the rule. I don't need an accent mark. Okay, here is a word that's a command. It uses, oh, I have tagged on come. Come means eat. Oh, no, actually, this one has only one, uh, one pronoun, okay. Uh, Come means eat, okay? I have tagged on lo. The lo means it. So somebody is, is giving an order. They're saying, hey, eat it. Okay. Termina en o. It ends in o. That would mean, traditionally, you would think this is where you should hear the stress. Listen to how this word sounds. Comelo. 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 Lleva acento o no lleva acento? Do I need an accent mark or not? Lleva acento, sí o no? Sí. Lleva acento. This one needs an accent mark. O. Oh. Comelo. Nor normalmente, me. You would think from the way it is written that you would punch the me, but we don't. The way we pronounce that word, we punch the o. Oh. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about this today. This is kind of a special situation. Comelo comes from comer, right? Whenever we tag these little pronouns on that you practiced with last week, whenever we tag on a pronoun, um, the core thing we're looking at is how that verb 
sounds before I do anything with tacking on, pinning on an extra pronoun. I always want the verb, which is the core of that communication. The core of that communication is eat. The look just tells what I want you to eat. That, that core action part of the word must remain with the same kind of pronunciation and stress. So once I added on an extra syllable and it changed that stress, that verb, uh, that action of comer, never, never will punch that M-E. It's always going to punch this co part, co, okay? Okay. Uh, abril, abril. Abril is April, abril, abril. Lleva acento or no lleva acento? Abril. No lleva acento. And this pays attention to uh, the way we pronounce it, follows the rule. Uh, oh, perdón. Why did I stress that? Perdón. Abril. And here is uh, abril. No, abril. Um, we do punch the end. It ends in a consonant that is not N, that is not S. We punch the end of the syllable. We do punch the end syllable. I don't need any kind of accent mark. Okay, tenemos feliz. Feliz, feliz termina en Z. This ends in Z, Z. Feliz. Lleva acento no lleva acento? No lleva acento, feliz, feliz. This is, we're supposed to punch the last syllable the way I say feliz does obey that rule. I don't need any kind of accent mark. Uh, inteligente. Inteligente. Termina en E. It ends in a vowel. Inteligente. Inteligente. Lleva o oh, no? No lleva acento. Okay. Inteligente. Okay. Uh, second to last syllable is what should get the punch. Here is the second to last syllable. Inteligente. Yep, the way I say it obeys the rule. Second to last syllable gets the punch. It obeys the rule. I don't need any kind of accent mark. Okay, la palabra lejos. Lejos termina en S. It ends in an S. Words that end in a vowel or N or S stress the second to last syllable. Here is the second to last syllable. Lejos, lejos. Lleva acento o no lleva acento? No necesito, doesn't need it. It obeys the rules. Okay. Tenemos la palabra cerca. Cerca quiere decir nearby or near. Okay. Uh, with a word that ends in a vowel or N or S, we stress the second to last syllable. Here is the second to last syllable, and here's the way I pronounce the word, cerca, cerca. Lleva acento o no? No. It obeys the rule. I don't need any kind of an accent mark. Muy bien. Uh, ooh. There are two words that, hmm, okay, you'll see. Termina en A. This ends in A, a vowel. Normally, normally second to the last syllable gets the stress for a word that ends in a vowel. There in bold is the second to last syllable. Okay. I'm going to pronounce this word. Está. Está. Lleva acento o no? Si sí, lleva acento, it does need an accent mark, está. Okay, momentito. I'm gonna show you another word. And ooh, I need to put it here because when I do a new line, it always capitalizes and I can't put in accent marks with capitalized words unless I do special keys, which I can't remember. There is, however, whoop. There is, however, oops. Ay, a ver. There is a word esta. 
There is a word esta. And actually, I'm going to show you something else. Actually, it, it used to be spelled that way. Esta used to be spelled that way. The wise old gray haired men in Madrid who come in and talk about what rules we should have for the language about 10 years ago decided we're not going to do that anymore. Uh, but if you do hear the word pronounced esta, it used to need an accent mark. The wise old men who make the language rules decided, let's just drop that rule because it's dumb, because this obeys the rule. Why should we write an accent mark? Why should we distinguish between the word that means this thing? It means this thing. Por ejemplo, esta, esta es mi taza de café. Esta es mi taza de café. This is my coffee cup. Esta, this thing. When esta means this thing, it sounds like esta, okay? But same letters, different stress, the word esta, means he is, she is. Por ejemplo. Uh, ooh, mi gata está muy impaciente. Mi gata está muy impaciente. My cat's very impatient. Uh, mi, mi hijo está muy contento. My son is very happy. Está. Está. The verb gets an accent mark. Esta, this thing, doesn't need an accent mark. It used to. It's very hard for me to write it without an accent mark. 30 years of learning how to do that. And then they say, we're changing the rules. <laughs> that is what happens sometimes. Um, and the reason that happens, actually, they do have little old guys, literally, who get together from all the different countries that speak Spanish. And they decide based on usage, if most people in the majority of those countries don't do, don't follow a certain rule anymore, because like the common guy on the street has decided 70 or 80% of them, this is stupid. They change the rule. That really happens. Okay. All right. Bueno, está bien. Está bien. Okay, now I'm going to tell you, if you find the whole accent thing a little bit hard, uh, here's a little general thing, which hopefully makes you feel better. Um, my husband is a very smart man. He's way smarter than I am in many different ways. <laughs> he cannot hear that difference very well at all between stress and syllables. He also can't sing on key. If you are tone deaf, people who are tone deaf have, and if you have any slight difficulty singing out of key, if you're a little tone deaf, for people who have that, that is very, very hard to hear that. It's, I kid you not. I've known more than one person who's had that issue. Okay, está bien? Está bien, bueno. Entonces, uh, díganme, vamos a cambiar de tema. We're going to change our theme a little bit. We're going to change our theme and our questions. Uh, lo, el, lo, el ejercicio, el primer ejercicio de este libro, uh, I'd like to change gears a little so that we see where these pronouns that receive action, where they go in the sentence, because that is the hard thing, right? Knowing that, uh, knowing that metenos 
mean me, you, us, is not so tough. Figuring out that lo and la mean it or a human being of that, whichever, whichever sex it is, or that los or las means them, right? Lo or la can mean it, lo or la could mean him or her. That's not so tough. But where they go in the sentence is weird for us as English speakers because our word order in English is not the same, okay? And you can, you can make certain assumptions that in Spanish, when we use one of these words that we call pronouns, and by the way, that's going to mean no matter what kind of pronoun, we're just looking at direct objects. There are others. I'm not going to burden them all. I'm not going to burden you with all of them at the same time. We need to take a break from that topic for a while. Uh, no matter what kind of pronoun it is, direct, indirect, reflexive, any of that stuff, where it goes in the sentence in Spanish, is consistent with these rules. So when you learn different kinds of pronouns later, where they go in the sentence will follow these same rules you're learning today. But these are today for direct objects. Me, te, nos, lo en la, los en las. Okay. Normally they come in front of the verb. Normalmente en frente del verbo. This is the opposite of what we do in English. So when you're just making a statement of fact, I'm calling him, lo llamo. In Spanish, literally becomes him I call, lo llamo. This is not normal for you. You want to say, llamo lo. I call him, right? Because your brain wants to put the words in that order, but we can't put them in that order for a statement of fact. That's the important thing for a statement of fact, meaning you're just observing something and telling what's happening what is actually really happening, whether that is now, in the past, in the future, a statement of fact, okay? En frente del verbo, in front of the verb. So that goes against the grain of our English word order. But there are some exceptions to that. So if I've got two verbs working together, I have a choice of where I can put the word mete nos, lo la, los or las. I can put them in front of the first verb that is conjugated, like always, or I can attach it to the end of the infinitive, and it all becomes one big word, okay? Either way is correct. One is not more common than another. People say whatever they feel like at that time, okay? Um, you can also attach these little pronouns to something called the gerund. The gerund means a verb that means ing. We have not used that very much. You've seen a few examples. Por ejemplo, estoy, eh, estoy, uh, comprando. Estoy comprando just means I am buying. I am buying with the ing on the end. Estoy comprando. How is that different from compro? Compro means I'm buying, or I do buy, or I buy. Estoy comprando. Estoy. I use that, that verb from estar. Estoy comprando. Ando makes it the ing in the idea of it is happening right now as we are speaking in real time. Okay. Estoy comprando. I am buying. Estoy comprándolo. I am buying it. I can't attach the word lo to the end of the ando. Estoy comprándolo. I can also say lo estoy comprando. It, I am buying. So you should know that sometimes we can attach these little words, me, te, nos, lo, la, los, las, to the ends of things. We can attach them to the ends of ando or yendo, the ing. Don't worry about that too much yet. We can attach it to the end of an infinitive when I have two verbs working together, okay? 
And what's important for you when you are listening to people talk in listening comprehension is that people often, often, off, well, often, no, change that, next. People have to, have to attach the me, te, nos, lo, la, los, las, have to, to an affirmative command. If the command is a go do it command, you have to attach it. So you will hear people saying things like, bebelo, 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 drink it, because it's a command. They want you to do something, bebelo. And the lo is referring to the stuff in here. You don't drink the cup, you drink what's in the cup, right? Café, es café aquí. Bebelo, drink it. So if it's an affirmative command, you will hear people tag that word onto the end, that little pronoun onto the end. Okay, otro ejemplo. Por ejemplo, somebody says, call him now, right? Somebody's missing in your group. Call him. Llámalo. Llámalo. Call him. Call her. Llámala. Uh, Call them, llámalos, llámalos. So you will hear people tag things on, tag pronouns on, I wanna be exact, tag pronouns on to the end of a verb when it's a command and order telling you go do it. If the command is don't do it, the pronoun goes back in front of the noun or in front of the verb, excuse me, pardon. okay. Preguntas. Let's take a look at these. I have two questions already from these exercises. Estos ejercicios. Y estoy en la página 184, 185. The questions I have so far are número seis, number six. Uh, número seis, Francisca. Francisca, Francie. Uh, Francesca, depende, ¿no? Francisca, uh, Francisca quiere a su amigo Pablo. Francisca loves her friend Pablo. And they wanted you to decide, ooh, how to use the love and how to use the him. Ella lo quiere mucho. Ella lo quiere mucho. Now I want you to notice something. The lo takes the place of all these words. Lo literally boots out, kicks out all these words. A su amigo Pablo. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro. Four words disappear. The a personal, which I told you was so darn important, that has to disappear too if I put a pronoun to stand in its place. So in other words, I cannot say ella a lo quiere or ella lo quiere a. I can't do that. The a su amigo Pablo, all those words, it's like you drew a great big line through them. Ella lo quiere. Ella lo quiere. She loves him. Okay? Entienden? Make sense? Okay. Uh, there is a difference. Question also came up on the difference between querer and amar. We'll come back to that in a bit. Um, okay. Hay otras preguntas. Uh, do you want me to go through how all of them are, because most of you could look them up. Maybe you didn't realize you could look up the answers in the back. Should I go through a quick rundown on all of them? Todos or no? Maybe just the ones where we've got questions. Okay. I'm, I'm confused by 12 and 15. I think they're similar. 12 and 15. Okay. Doce. Ooh, es difícil. This is a hard one. <laughs> Uh, okay, es normal. This would be a normal one for you to have a hard time. After, after calling him. Okay. 
¿Cómo se dice after? After, después. But now we have to know that what you really need is not just después, but después de. Después de. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, después de llamarlo. Después de llamarlo. All I've got is llamar. Después de llamarlo is uh, kind of a prepositional phrase. After calling, I haven't conjugated llamar at all. Right. And because I've got it by its lonesome infinitive self, the only thing I can really do is to tag on the love to the end of it. That was a hard one. Understand why we're using the infinitive. Oh, oh, okay. Buena pregunta. Why are we using an infinitive? Because anytime a verb is used after a preposition, it must, has to, 100% of the time, go into infinitive form. It's a rule it. they have. <laughs> I'm going to do a share screen to show you what kind of situations that will come up in. Okay. Prepositions, prepositions. Oh, prepositions are such a pain in the neck. Que lata. Lata is a nice slang word for pain in the neck. Okay. Prepositions are words like this, guys. Ah, and de, para, por. Okay, there are a whole bunch more. Uh, oh, there are some that are compound, like enfrente, de, but look, the key is we still have de, like you have de up here, right? Some of the enfrente de, in front of, right? Uh, detrás, de, uh, encima, de, Encima de means on top of, detrás de means behind, encima de, on top of, uh, debajo de, uh, underneath, debajo del libro, debajo del libro, ¿sí? Okay. A ver, uh, anytime you use an, uh, an infinitive, a verb-ish idea, after a preposition, it has to go back into infinitive form. So, uh, después de, uh, después de estudiarlo, after studying it. Uh, oh, let's use antes de, después de, after, antes de, before. Uh, antes de contestarla uh, after or before answering it uh, antes de contestarla uh, escucha antes de contestarla escucha la pregunta before answering it listen to the question so anytime you have a word de or en or para uh, and you've got a, a verb type idea, you need to put that verb into an infinitive form. Uh, algo muy común. Para is something very, very common to use with verbs. So, okay, por ejemplo. Um, Para aprender, para aprender el español, uh, tienes que escuchar bien. Para aprender, in order to learn. In order to learn. Uh, aprender is an infinitive because it follows a word that we classify as a preposition. Mm -hmm. All verbs that follow a preposition, and I mean right next to the preposition, they have to go into 
an infinitive form. It's a rule they have. And it's a 100% thing. No exceptions to that. Okay, got it. <laughs> okay, otra, hay otra. Is there another one on this exercise that puzzled you? Nada? That makes, mostly makes sense? Mm -hmm. See, okay. Uh, what I would want to work with you a little bit here is uh, I want to work with this idea of what we do with a pronoun when somebody gives you a command. Because when you're listening to people speak to you, they will throw these words, lo, la, los, las, you know, around all the time. Um, you are looking at aceitunas. Aceitunas. Aceitunas son... Aceitunas son olives, ¿verdad? Olives. Okay. Olives. If I ask... Uh, uh, I'm going to ask like a standard question first. ¿Quieres las aceitunas? You want olives? ¿Cómo se dice I want them? I want them. ¿Quieres? Yo lo quiero. Um, it probably won't be low because it's aceitunas, more than one. Los. It'll be las. Las. Aceitunas. Las quiero. Oh, sí, las quiero. Las quiero. I want them. But now, if I give you a command and I tell you, eat them, now the them will be tagged on because now it's a command. Comelas. Comelas. Oh, statement of fact, las quiero, las quiero. But somebody puts these on a tray and says, comelas. They want you to do something. Comelas. Eat them. Eat them. Bien? Okay. Uh, somebody says, ah, yo tomo café. You drink it. Toma. Take a cup. Toma café. El café. Toma. Lo. It's el café. Tome lo. Tómalo. Tómalo. Have some. Yeah. Have some. Tómalo. You have some. Tómalo. Bien. Bébelo. Tómalo. Take it. Bien. Bien. OK. Otro ejemplo. I want to show you the difference between putting it in front and tagging it on. Um, cada domingo, los domingos, leo el periódico. ¿Cómo se dice I read it in the morning? I read it. Fact. Statement of fact. Lo leo, lo leo en la mañana. Lo leo por la mañana o lo leo en la mañana igual. Same thing. See? Leo. Lo leo. Lo leo. I read it. Okay. Now what if I make it a command? Read it. Lee. There's the command. Read it. Léelo. 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 I tag it on because it's a command. Léelo. Léelo. Okay. Um, okay. Oh, uh, miro, miro, uh, el titular, miro el titular, el titular, el titular is the headline. Okay. El titular. Miro el titular. Ah, lo miro, lo miro. I'm Looking. Looking at it. Here's one of the most common commands you'll hear people say on the street. People say, look at it. Mira is the command. 
¿Cómo Mira se dice? Lo. Look at it. Míralo. 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 Ok. Por ejemplo. Ah, cuando, cuando soy turista, tomo un mapa. Tomo un mapa. Bien, sí. Oh, take it. Toma. Uh, tómalo. Tómalo. Ah, lo tomo. That's a statement of fact. I'm doing it right. Ah, lo tomo. Lo tomo. But if I tell you, hey, if I hand it to you, tómalo. It's a command. So I want you to understand the difference between, and somebody's talking at you, telling you to do it, they're going to tag this, the word lo, onto the end, right? El mapa. El mapa. Marilyn? Sí. I'm sorry. Why are, are we using the formal you for all these? Because if I handed you a newspaper and said, read it, I wouldn't say... There are, uh, that gets into a little bit of a complicated topic, which is that there are three, well, there's more than three, but for you guys being near Latin America, there are three different commands. There are commands for tú, okay. somebody you're on friendly basis with, but, uh-oh, there are commands for negative tú that are different. That's hard. And then, usted and ustedes will each get a separate kind of command. So we're basically, so if I had said you read, and I had this trouble with my homework. Okay. I, I would have said Lazlo, Lazlo instead of Lilo. Oh, oh, no, 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 no. Okay. The command. Okay. Leer, yeah. leer. Bien? Right. Leer. Okay. Right. Normally, the way if you say somebody, if you, if I say, hey, you're reading, mm -hmm. que les, what are you reading, que les, right. yeah. I'm asking, you're actually doing it, and I'm saying, oh, you're doing that, what are you doing that with, que les, that's a statement of fact, but if I tell you, hey, read it, I take the S off the end, le, it becomes So that's just standard. standard, that you just do that, okay, you just do that, if it becomes a command, the S comes off the end, it's more complicated than that, but that's all you need to know for now. Right. Yeah. For yeah. most of them, yeah. So that's why it's uh, le, le. It, well, that's why it's mira. We take the s off the end. That's why it's toma. Gracias. The that, off the end. I did all of those on the homework last night sí. because I was using. Oh, the por ejemplo, es una cerveza, no? Es una cerveza. Sí. Ok. Uh, si quiero usar el, el verbo beber y quiero indicar que yo quiero que tú veas esto. I want you to drink this. La cerveza. I take beber. Bebes. I ditch the S off of bebes. I say bebe, which means do this, right? I want you to do that. ¿Cómo se dice drink it? Bebela. 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 Drink it. Bebela. Bebela. Bien. Ah, I tell you to buy this book. Uh, if I'm just talking about a fact, ah, uh, Compro el libro, compro este libro, I'm buying this book, compro este libro, uh, porque es, es una novela importante, es una novela importante en la literatura española, pero buy it, compra. Comprando. Compralo. 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 Yeah. Ok. ¿Cómo se dice pay me? Pagar. I want you to do it. I tell you, pay me. Pagame. 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 And all would have accents on the first uh, 
syllable, right? We would need an accent on the first syllable. So I'm going to put down, I'm actually, I'm going to bring up the screen. We're going to take a look at that. Sometimes adding a pronoun to a command verb will mean that you need an accent mark. Not all the time, but often. Okay, so let's look at this word pagame. So the key is that, you know, the important thing is, uh, well, the important thing may be me and this idea. <laughs> Paga, there's your command, right? But when I turn it into pagame, it tells who I want you to pay, right? Uh, and let's see, okay, so the last letter is a vowel which means normally under normal situations, the second, the last syllable gets the punch. But the verb itself is paga, and, right? And paga punches that pa side. And once I'm, I still want it to sound like that because I want it to sound like paga all the time, the me is just this afterthought of who I want to be paid, okay? So we want to put more emphasis on that. Uh-oh, but now by saying pagame, I am changing uh, the way I pronounce the word is breaking the rule of what gets more stress. So I do need to add in the accent mark on pagame. Ah, pagame. Uh, otro ejemplo. I'm going to give you another one. This is an odd, odd command, but it's a command that is a common command. Okay. Uh, it doesn't. Uh, uh, ooh, ooh, ooh. D. D. Tell. That's a familiar command. D. Tell me is. Dime. Ooh. Ends in a consonant. We put more stress on suck to the last syllable. The way I pronounce it is dime, even though I tagged on a vowel. It obeys the rule. I don't need an accent mark there. I did on pagame. I do not on dime. What if I give that verb of tell me and I make it a polite or a formal command? D is a familiar or buddy type command, but the formal command is not D, it's diga. It needs to be a different command because it's a formal, it's an usted command, right? Diga. And now you've got the command, digame, tell me, digame. Ends in a vowel. Normally we stress second to the last syllable, but the way I pronounce this word is digame. Digame, which means I am violating, my pronunciation violates, breaks the rule. I need to write in the accent mark on digame. Digame, por favor, digame, por favor, tell me, please. Bien? Mm -hmm. Vale? Mm -hmm. Okay. And of course, really, when you're speaking, it just kind of naturally comes out, digame. But when you see it written down, it'll look like that. Bien. Okay. Hay más preguntas. Are there more questions? Sí o no? No, no, no. Okay. A ver. Um, we're going to come back to another question. We have a little question about the Francisca quiere a su amigo Pablo. <laughs> this is a brief question. Uh, quiere means to want, quiere also means to love. There are different levels of love in Spanish. <sighs> okay. Um, I will actually send you the video, video on this later on so you can watch it. Quiere is used with family members and it's used with a boyfriend or girlfriend if you're at kind of an early, we're getting established dating phase. You've been out together a few times, you've been dating for a while. Uh, mom and dad, brothers, sisters, cousins, quiere is great. 
Some people have said, wait a minute, don't we have that verb amar? Amar means to love too. When do I use quiere? When do I use amar? Uh, you can use quiere with your amig uh, amigos, friends. I love my friends. Quiero a mis amigos. It, it means I have a deep affection, mm -hmm. a deep attachment to my friends. I love my friends, right? But if you're talking like deep romantic attachment, like we are like, this could become a permanent thing someday. That's when Amar steps in. <laughs> Amar is more for romantic love and really well-established romantic love. Uh, two dates does not hit the Amar category. And if it does, you know your daughter is just going to fall head over heels and you better put the brakes on. Because how long have you known each other? Yeah, one of those. And there is yet another verb. Actually, gustar can be used kind of at that level, but it is very low level, like I'm attracted to you. So I'm going to send you a cute video on that because vale la pena. It is worth the effort to listen to that, but we won't listen to it during class. So there is a difference between querer and amar. Amar is a stronger, established, emotional love, deep love, amar. Querer is a deep love, but for family, for friends, uh, you know, maybe not necessarily serious if you're, you know, talking about opposite sex. Yeah. And there'll be a, a third one you'll see. Marilyn, then see. En encanta. Encanta is another love, but for something. Encanta is to love a thing. Okay. Me encanta la cerveza. Me encanta la cerveza. A mi hijo le encanta la cerveza. My, my son loves beer. <laughs> he, you know what you could say, you could use encantar with somebody you're really, really taken with, like you met them recently. And uh, let's say that your, your daughter brought her boyfriend home. You met your daughter's boyfriend for the first time and you think he is a great guy. You could say, ah, oh, me encanta. I love him. You could. Es uh, posible, it is possible. But encantar is very, very commonly used just for things. And it could be used for person. Okay, bien, vale. Mm -hmm. Bueno, okay, I want to leave a little bit of time for our Dia de Muertos, un poquito de tiempo aquí. Okay, I'm going to preview because I want to leave you enough time. Um, a menos que tengan una pregunta, unless one of you guys has a really, really uh, deep question, in which case you should ask it. Uh, we're going to leave the pronoun thing aside for just a bit, and we're going to tackle a different topic. Donde esta mi libro? Oh. Me deje caer. Oh, aquí está. Okay, bien. Um, a lot of you asked about, how do I know, how do I know when adjectives come in front of a noun or in back of an, wait a minute, I thought adjectives were supposed to come after the noun they talk about, but then I saw, I, heard somebody say, mi gran amigo, why is the gran in front of amigo? What is going on with that? Um, I think that is a good topic mm -hmm. for us to cover now. Adjectives and uh, where they go and why they go in those places. Uh, so I'm going to give you the big picture idea. And um, I'll ask you to read some pages, Marianne. I'll give you the, the list here, or the, the actual links to these. Está en, en la información, está en las páginas 102, 102, 102, hasta, uh, 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 muy importante. The really important stuff will be 108, 108. Uh, 102. 102 is going to talk about possessive adjectives. And for a lot of you, that's that's something you've seen before. Um, and then it's going to talk about adjectives of nationality, 
I would skim that. It's going to give you pages and pages and pages of nationalities. Now, that's not to say they're not important. You know, Japonese, Cubano, uh, Portugues, uh, uh, Suiza, Chileno, all those. Yeah, nationalities are good to know. But I would not like you know, have a conniption over how to say Taiwanese or how to say Hindu or, you know, oh my gosh, I forgot the word for Irish. E, you know, don't sweat that so much. Take a look at them. A lot of them will look cognate like. Um, you know, be familiar with some of them, but don't like try to memorize every single one because there's so many of them, right? Um, you know, become familiar with the ones that you personally would need to know more. If you know, if you had a lot of family from Asia, you may want to look at those more. Or maybe not. Depending. What I want you to focus on is this idea. Adjectives fall into two broad categories. We want to look at the big picture. Because we don't want you to get like too caught up in too many rules because once you start it got to start to put words in word order that becomes really really tough if it varies from what you're used to in English. Adjectives vary a lot in between Spanish for word order and English for word order. El carro rojo, el carro rojo, right? Red car. El carro alemán, German car. Bien, sí. Uh, uh, ooh. Um, la, la cerveza canadiense, Canadian beer, okay? So, okay. We have basically two big, big picture categories. Most of the time, an adjective will follow a noun. That is the opposite of what you're used to. We say red car, they say car red. They say beer Canadian, right? They say car German. Most of the time, when an adjective literally paints a picture in your brain, it's going to follow that noun. But not all adjectives paint a picture that pops up in your brain. You know what I mean by that, a picture that pops up in your brain. It creates an immediate mental image, right? Um, if it creates an immediate mental image, it will follow the noun. It will do what it not it does not do in English. Uh, una, um, una chica roya, a blonde girl. Blonde paints, paints a really, you know, definite idea in your mind, okay? But words like my, our, his, they don't really paint an image. They don't create a physical image. They just tell you who owns something. And adjectives like this, this beer, beer versus that beer, okay? This can versus those cans. This and those, they tell you kind of how close something is. Uh, my versus yours tells who, it, who owns it. But they don't really paint a picture of what the thing looks like. So all those little adjectives that don't create a mental image, they will come in front of the noun. So is mi cerveza, su cerveza, his beer. Yeah. Uh, ooh, aquella lata, that can over there. Esta lata, this can right here. Uh, words like this, that, what, words like numbers. Words like quantities, like numbers or 
Oh, like a definite number, ocho, nueve. Okay, that paints maybe a, an image in your brain, but it's just counting, right? Uh, those kind of things will come in front of nouns, and that's what those pages are going to talk to you about. Okay. And they're pretty simple, but there's a difference between saying, Miguel es mi amigo viejo and Miguel es mi viejo amigo. There's a big difference between those two. And you'll read about that this coming week and we'll practice it with some with lots of things. So what I want you to think of is that quantities come in front of nouns. Anything talking about quantity, be it specific or vague, Things that don't paint a really vivid <laughs> mental picture come in front of the noun. But things that paint a definite mental image, create a mental image of what that thing or that person looks like, they will follow the noun, okay? But you'll read about that. Um, okay, a ver. Oh, Dia de Muertos. So your, your homework will be to read that. Um, I'll give you a little um, a little uh, video on the differences in the different levels of love. Querer, gustar, amar, all of those. Bien. Uh, I'm also going to give you a longish video to watch on Dia de Muertos. And I would like you to watch that soon. Okay, Dia de Muertos. Dia de Muertos um, always happens in Mexico on November 2nd into November 3rd. It is really kind of a combination of two cultures. Uh, out of warfare and conquest came this holiday. Um, and if you live it any, for any amount of time in Arizona, you will see the Ave Muertos. And you know, you see the kind of skeleton figures and stuff in it. It looks kind of scary, but it is not Halloween. Halloween, however, came from very, very long ago, a sort of a similar idea, but they are not the same. Uh, it, okay, when the Spaniards came and conquered the Americas uh, and subjugated the indigenous people who were already living here, which that's another story, but anyway, a lot of hard feelings about that as one can well imagine. Uh, the Spaniards were, of course, very, very intent upon making every indigenous person a good little Catholic, because this is part of their job to be saved in the world, you know. We're coming just out of that medieval phase of Europe, and, you know, part, part of the, uh, um, the real motivation is always economic. Let's get land and let's make money. <laughs> and that was the motivation behind conquering all of the Americas and taking them over for your country. But, you know, the good little monks came out with them and said, our job is to make them good little Christians. And they, they sought very hard to do that. And we're pretty successful at doing that. But in, in the interest of winning over the populace, quite often uh, what would happen is an existing Christian tradition would meld and merge with an existing indigenous tradition. And that is what happened with Dia de Muertos. The, the existing Christian tradition, which they were trying to you know, uh, inculcate to proselytize amongst the indigenous peoples was Catholicism. And November, uh, uh, November 1st is uh, uh, All Saints Day in the Catholic calendar, Catholic, the year, well, in the church calendar. Uh, All Saints Day celebrates the uh, uh, remembering that there are human beings, everyday guys and gals like all of us, who lived exemplary lives, died, and lived their afterlife in paradise, in heaven. And we are celebrating those souls who were fortunate and, and perseverant, you know, they persevered in life, they would live a good life, and they do not walk the earth with us, but they exist in another realm in heaven. It is a celebration of those souls and looking to them as models of how we ourselves should live. Well, the Aztecs, who were the indigenous peoples of uh, the southern areas of, of Mexico, had an existing tradition 
uh, which was Day of the Dead, Dia de Muertos. And this happened always around the same time as all, so, uh, you know, all Saints Day and All Souls Day in the Catholic Church. And these traditions kind of melded. But Dia de Muertos was the idea that once a year, uh, during the harvest time of year, uh, end of October, beginning of November, your ancestors, according to the Aztec leaves, would come back to see if their families remembered them. As long as your family remembered you, you were okay in the afterlife. Uh, so to celebrate that, the Aztecs would um, put up picture. Well, they didn't have pictures at that time, but now they do that. Uh, they would remember their loved ones with the items that that person used to use in real life, with the kinds of foods and drinks that they would consume in real life. Uh, nowadays, the custom would be to put up a, a photo of your departed beloved one, which of course back in Aztec times, you wouldn't have a photo. Um, but the idea was that their spirit would come back to see if they were remembered and they would be saddened and, you know, wow, you're disappointing your ancestors if you don't do that. So these two traditions kind of melded and um, their, their use of the whole skeleton thing uh, looks to our minds to be kind of scary and Halloween-like, but it is merely sort of a, uh, from the Mexican point of view, uh, mocking that death has control over you. Yes, everyone will become a skeleton. What of it? Uh, and the idea was to, you know, decorate these skeletons and create skeleton costumes and figures and little sugar skulls and all kinds of things. But the big important thing was to build a little, little altar in your home where you would celebrate the life of your family members. So uh, there will be a little uh, video for you to watch on that. And, and the long one, it's about 15 minutes, will be cultural. And the short one, which follows, will be talking about using adjectives. Cultura y gramática. They're going to have a little listening drill that is not so much culturally oriented, but grammar oriented and a cultural video. Está bien. Magnifico. Okay. So I want you to focus. We're going to go away from the whole grammar thing, but talk more about descriptions. And when you come back on uh, next week, uh, la semana que viene, the week that is coming, la semana que viene, uh, we will practice a lot of uh, describing things in pictures and, um, yeah, just revisiting that because we always use descriptions for things. Está bien. Magnifico. Okay. A ver. I will probably send you a list of little questions I will have you use next week that have descriptions, adjectives in them. Some of them will precede nouns, some will follow the nouns. So uh, in a day or two, I will send you that little set of questions, or I may be able to set it up on the, you know what, I'll be able to set it up on the uh, near pad, I think. And those will be the questions I want you to ponder, think about, and go off and talk about in small groups. So you're going to be talking about things like, um, your first car, or maybe your last car, your old friends, and all kinds of other descriptions. Está bien. Magnifico. Okay. Son las once. Wow, we're right at, ah, son las once y uno. It's 11.01. I'm on time for a change. Vale, magnifico. Okay. Espero que tengan buena semana. I hope you all have a good week. If you didn't go out and vote yet, oh, you've got tomorrow. Pueden votar mañana, no? Okay. A ver. Y todo está bien. All is good. Uh, hay preguntas antes de salir, before leaving. Hay preguntas o no? No hay. No hay. Okay. Vale, magnífico. De nada, de nada, que tengan buena semana. Everybody have a good week. Cuídense. Take really good care of yourselves. Adios. Stay well. Adios. Bye, Marilyn.
Bye.